Welcome back to the part five of the Ed and Lorraine documentary. If you haven't seen the previous parts, then you can click the link of the playlist, which is mentioned in the description. And please like and subscribe so we can reach our 10,000 subscribers goal by the end of the year. From abandoned railways to roadways carved through mountains, Japan's tunnels are filled with dark histories and ghostly tales. Here are three of the most chilling haunted tunnels. First, let's enter the infamous Kiyotaki Tunnel in Kyoto. Built in the 1920s, this 444-meter-long tunnel was once a railway tunnel, notorious for the harsh conditions workers endured during its construction. Legend has it that many workers lost their lives due to overwork and accidents, and their restless spirits linger. Locals say that if you drive through Kiyotaki Tunnel at night, you might see ghostly figures wandering aimlessly or catch a glimpse of a woman dressed in white. But beware, if you see her in your rearview mirror, they say it means you'll soon face a tragic accident. Next, we have the Inunaki Tunnel, located in the Fukuoka Prefecture. Often called one of Japan's most haunted places, this tunnel is the center of dark legends and paranormal activities. Inunaki Tunnel was once the site of a brutal murder, and people believe the spirit of the victim haunts the area, seeking revenge. Visitors report feeling an overwhelming sense of dread as they enter. Some have heard whispers, others have seen handprints appear on the walls and vanish. In fact, the area around the tunnel is so infamous that local authorities have blocked it off, warning people to stay away. Lastly, we journey to Yamanashi's Oiranbuchi Tunnel. This tunnel is connected to the tragic legend of Oiran, or courtesans, during the Sengoku period. It's said that many Oiran were betrayed and thrown into the river from a cliff above, and their spirits are believed to haunt the surrounding area to this day. Now let's hear from the Warrens about their experience. When I pass on, you'll be waiting for me at the Rainbow Bridge. Mm -hmm. well, we, we do know this, Tony, that any animal that is loved by a human being will survive the grave. In other words, we will be with those animals again because they do have a soul. God created them with a soul. And the fact that they were loved by human beings assures them that they will be with us someday. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would heaven be without them? I know. I, mean, I had another I dog named Lucy that lived about a year with me. Just I found on Route 84, a border collie. I found her on Route 84 on July 5th. Mm -hmm. I think the year was 1994. Mm -hmm. She died one year to the day, July 5th, 1995. Mm -hmm. And she was a great, a great dog too that was with me all the time. Anywhere I went, she went with me. You, when you lose an animal, it's, it's almost worse than losing a human being. I mean, a lot of people out mm -hmm. there have lost human beings. Ed has lost everyone in his family. Lorraine has lost almost everyone in her family. I've lost everyone in my family, but it hurts the same as if it was a human. Mm -hmm. But that solace that Ed said, they will be there waiting for us. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that we cling to. And I hope that everybody out there who has lost an animal recently believes this, because it is true that they will be waiting for you. On a lighter note, I think it's a lighter note, we're going to talk about Japan. Mm -hmm. Ed was in Japan in 19, was it 45, Ed, or 46? 45. 45. 1943 to 1946, he was in the United States Navy as an armed guard. World War II. And he spent time in Japan in Nagoya, and I believe you said Tokyo. He'll, you'll talk about it. Yes. But 55 years later, Ed and Lorraine go back to Japan. Ed's there during the war. Mm -hmm. He sees destruction all around him. Everything's different. It's just a, a nightmare back then. He goes back 55 years later with Lorraine to investigate hauntings. Why don't you tell us about it, Ed? Well, it was so different than what I expected, Tony. You know, when I was there, I was on Okinawa. Uh, the war was over because of the atom bomb. And we didn't expect it to be over. Mm -hmm. We were already putting numbers on our ships, you know, for the invasion of Japan. One day a small LST pulled up, and uh, this was in late August, and said that some bomb was dropped on on uh, Japan and that it was going to end the war. Well, we didn't really believe it. Not until the second time we heard it. And of course it was a horrible thing that occurred 
I wish it never had to occur because the Japanese people are beautiful people. And uh, Lorraine found this out when we went to Japan. And understand that it's not the people of these countries that start these wars. It's the warlords, the warmongers, the politicians. These are the ones that are responsible. But uh, when I seen Japan 56 la years later, I was amazed. I was shocked. Mm -hmm. Because these cities that have been bombed out, nothing but rubble, uh, nothing but smoke, uh, smokestacks in some cases standing, people starving, uh, rags. Now we go back and here are these beautiful, magnificent, uh, modern buildings. The streets, the cars, all brand new. The people were very beautiful. Oh, they to were. And I. I have to tell you, Tony, before we even go into these cases, I have to tell you that this one day we traveled with an interpreter constantly. Ne that interpreter never left us. Mm -hmm. But after I was with the Japanese people for a period of time, uh, it's almost like you cross over that barrier and you are able to communicate to you a certain... You almost understand them. Yes, you do. And maybe you don't understand the language, but it's not the language. It's just you are just able to communicate. And this one night, I had said to them the whole story about Ed, about Ed, um, you know, being right off Okinawa, about, I didn't tell him the numbering of the ships for the invasion. I didn't get into things like that. But I told about the war ending. And he was a naval gunner, so he would have been, you know, he had to do something else. So they came aboard ship and they asked if anybody in the gunners knew anything about voice radio. And he said he did. And they sent him to Nagoya and he lived with the army. Now, there was nothing standing, but there was one building, Tony, and it belonged to Mishibishi, and it was a warehouse. And they had their office in this warehouse. I can go back over Ed's letters then, with the windows that he spoke on that looked out on, on the harbor and like that. And he lived with them, ate with them, and all. But everything outside of that was just rubble with smokestacks. Mm -hmm. And so I told him this, and I said, if I could just go and stand on that pier and look out at that harbor on, on the South Pacific, as my husband had 55 years ago. And your wife was born that night. Yeah. Isn't that, yes. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes. Isn't that something? Yes. I said, I, that would mean the world to me why I'm here, if I could do that, never knowing now what let, they were let me just interject. Do. My wife, uh, our Judy, daughter. happens to be uh, happens to be is Ed and Lorraine's uh, daughter. Yes. So when Ed was over in that building in Mitsubishi, Japan, uh, in the building uh, on January 11th, 1946, he was that's when Judy was born. Yes. Huh? Yes. Yep. Yes. January 11th, 1946, and we're there maybe a little over a week later, and we're right in the same spot where he was notified. And the first thing it said as he stood there, w when they finally took us there, is this is right where I stood when my daughter, when I was notified my daughter was born. And how did I celebrate? I had a plum pudding. Plum pudding? It was midnight when the uh, army notified me with a telegram that she had been born. And the strange thing was that at that same time, Japanese were celebrating their birthdays, 20 year olds. That's a it's big everybody's celebrate. birthday at that time. Really? And there was two destroyers out in the harbor. They were firing off rockets and so forth. Yeah. So Judy was born that night. It was a huge celebration for Japanese people in their 20s. And uh, it was a real holiday. Wow, that's wild. So that's how I remembered it. And then when we went back, of course, I never expected the building to be standing. It was. That one building was still there intact the way I had left it 56 years ago. That's amazing. We're going to be showing you uh, later in the okay, program. Okay, so what's the first thing we're going we to talk about? We have an exciting about? program <coughs> tonight, uh, and uh, it entails three different cases, Tony. One is a, uh, a condominium. Uh, no, they're, they're apartments, honey, really. Condominiums. Well, they call them condos yeah. over there. Yeah, they call them coops. Apartment houses. Uh, I think we can show the first well, pictures there. And... Um, 
Okay. Yes, that's, that's, that's our crew. That's, that's, that's crew. our crew. Yeah, that's our crew. Well, we're, we're at the bullet terminal. We, we traveled on the bullet train from Tokyo right. to Nagoya. And then from you the that's all the TV crew. That's not all of them. We're gonna we're going to well, still that's, pick that's, up more. They're all in the TV crew. Yeah, man. we're going to pick up the cameramen, but uh, okay, let's that's just go to next. And that's it. Who are those two strangers? <laughs> that's Ed and I um, at the terminal in Tokyo. We're still no, we're in Nagoya. We're in Nagoya there okay. at the terminal in Nagoya. Now uh, is that uh, the apartment? Yes, it is. And we meet up with our crew, and then we go. To, to this particular apartment building, mm -hmm. Tony. Okay. Now it's being built in two parts. That's on the left-hand side of the road. It's a road now, but it wasn't a road then. It was only a driveway, as it was explained to us. On the other side, across the street, the building is yet to be lived in, but it is basically the same type of building. Now in one of these photographs, you're going to see Mr. Tanako who was the building manager. Uh, Should I go to the next one? No, leave it there. Leave it, leave it there. And he was able, in <coughs> Japanese, and we're all sitting on the floor. Tony, that is something to get used to. I think I should tell him what happened in this building, though. Right? Well, well, he's going to tell us, honey. That's what I said. We're going to tell Who's him what... The manager. Well, the manager is going to tell us of all of these experiences, Tony, that people have had in all different apartments, and himself. And himself. Now there was a samurai warrior mm -hmm. whose head had been seen floating in a small building right across from this one, which we'll show you later. And this was the first sighting uh, of this particular ghost. Now samurai warriors, of course, were top dogs in them days. They would go into a village and they were the law. They were the executioners. They were the judges. And uh, then he started, the head started appearing in this building, but not just the head of the samurai warrior. There was a woman who had hung herself. They would see a young couple uh, who had been killed there. Mm -hmm. There was numerous ghosts that would show up here. But on that property, there was also many people buried alive mm -hmm. because of the uh, cholera. Cholera. Mm -hmm. Cholera. Animals and people were buried alive right where that mm -hmm. building is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we believe that that's had a lot to do with the hauntings occurring there. You can pull down the next one, Tony. Uh, there's the little oh. building right there. It's right across the street. Where the head of the samurai warrior was first seen. That's and you can see the new complex of buildings right mm -hmm. across, which are being built now, which we feel is also going to be, going to be haunted. Yes. Next or no? Yes. Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Tony. Now, that's, that's the man in charge. You notice that we're sitting on the floor to talk. Right. Take our shoes off right. as soon as we walk in. Tony, none of these buildings... I thought I'd need an ambulance to get me out of there oh. after an hour of sitting on that floor oh. next to this. Oh, boy. T Tony, that takes some getting used to. I mean, the Japanese people, they can squat to do everything. Mm -hmm. and well, we mean everything. And, uh, yeah, I got to get you, Ed. <laughs> I know what you mean. And but you don't have a picture of that, do you? No, bathroom? we didn't Not bring there. one of them, of the loo. That but, must have been fun. Uh, but anyway, that's that's painful to do when you're not used to it. That man was a very very beautiful person. Now who is he? That's Mr. Mr. Tanaka. He was the building manager. Tanaka, yeah. Mr. Tanaka, and he he too had phenomena occurring in his apartment uh -huh. where he stood so frightened and watch the curtains like something or someone pull the curtains back and forth in his apartment wow. and he was so scared of what was going to be on the other side when that curtain opened he thought he was going to see he has never seen that head he has seen the spirit of this woman who took her life he has seen things move we talked to numerous people a lot of young couples live in those condos, and he had a great deal of knowledge regarding the history of the area mm -hmm. as it appeared. Now, what I had discerned, Tony, in one of these photographs, you'll see it, is, it is the fact that... Um, Can we go to the next photo? Yeah. Oh, that's in the back, and that's where the water is. And... Um, Anyway, this, this is, is also the where the bodies were buried, buried. Uh, of the people buried alive. And Lorraine could feel 
the oh, vibrations awful. of these people. And when you walk through those buildings, even though I'm not sensitive, I could feel many things in there. Good. And we, this oh. is where we had to bring in the Buddhist disciples and priests who were to perform the exorcisms in that area. And they were going to do it, Tony. It entailed not just the buildings. It entailed doing something about the whole perimeter of these apartments because that's where everything was going on. Mm -hmm. We interviewed many, many young families and children, these darling little children. God, they were precious little kids. But that okay, is a real to, bad the area right now. there. Real bad area. Okay, now we got another one. Oh, okay. Now, when, while we were there at the condos before we go into, that's the tunnels where we're going to be going the mm -hmm. next day. But while we were there, Tony, uh, you could feel the coldness, you could sense the areas, and it seemed to be drawn a lot to the apartments where there were children. The spirits can use the energy of these kids. We did not, we were not able to stay long enough for the Buddhist priest to completely do that whole perimeter of the apartments, but this we were here for the exercise. The I've never, oh yes, I've we were never high. been in a colder place in my life than I went to that tunnel that really? night. Oh, it was terrible and scary. I'll tell you, if we say it was scary, it was it's scary. scary. It was. I remember terrible. that two hundred people were buried alive in that tunnel thirty-five years ago. An avalanche came down. During the mud. typhoon. They tried to escape into the tunnel, but what it did was trap them in there. Mm -hmm. On certain nights, people could hear the screams, the yells, the moans of these people. The horror which must have occurred there was horrific. When we went in there that night, I walked away from the cam crew and I went down to the other end. Yeah. And I've never felt anything like that. You know about the tunnels in uh, Fairfield Hills. This is a hundred times worse. Really? Mm -hmm. Yes. Now these people, Japanese, uh, would come over the mountain before they built that tunnel. That's why they built it. Mm -hmm. uh, they had salt and they had to bring it over to other villages on this side. From I the salt let me mines. See the next one, Tony. From the salt mines, yeah. Tony. Oh, look now at this, Tony. Now we see uh, ghost globules. This is entering the tunnel again. But if you look off on the right, you'll see all white ghost globules. Yep. These are spirits. Yep. And I think the next one also has that sound from the problem. other side. Yes, that's the other side. That's, that's coming out the other side. Yes, that's, that's the coming other side. out the other side, and that's where the salt mines are, right back there. Also, um, so you had a funny I, I have to there? tell you that. Oh, Tony, I was Can I have the next tears. Picture, Tony? The tears were coming right down my face. I had no control whatsoever. Now, the flowers that you see here on the floor of that tunnel were put there. Because of a young man, about three months ago, he defied the cursed tunnel. He thought it was a joke. He took his motorcycle through there at midnight. Oh. His friend standing at the other end heard screams and a crash. They went into the tunnel. He had been decapitated. The chain of his motorcycle had come off decapitated his head, and this is where he laid, right here. That's his friends had been there to put the, the flowers down. You don't challenge evil, and this particular tunnel has a lot of evil in it. Okay, that, uh, that's how, before, Tony, that tunnel was there. That is where, what they would use. They would go over that mountain. That's the top of the tunnel today. They would go over that mountain with their horses, and so the tunnel was built, so they had a place to go through. But today, there's a much bigger tunnel that has been built. And one of the reasons is because of the horrors that had taken place in that old tunnel. That area is so haunted, Tony, that people will not go up there at night. No. This foolish young man that went through the motorcycle, you know how young people are. Yeah. Well, they're no different in Japan. No, they're not. And it was a challenge, but he paid with his life for it. No. People say, well, a ghost can't hurt you. Right. You're not dealing with just ghosts here. No, you're not dealing. Look at this. There's, that's it. There, there's that is the spooky looking, huh? No, oh, it is spooky. If you were in that tunnel all by yourself at night, I walked down to the further end, away from the camera crew, and like I said, I've never felt such bitter cold iciness. And while we were in there, uh, the Buddhist disciples came in 
were saying the rituals of exorcism, suddenly we heard a huge crash, crash about five foot away from us. Heavy ice came down, all of a sudden broke right in front of us. I never Ooh. seen anything like it. But there was, was no so bitter thaw. Cold. But no thaw, no thaw at all. I no can't thaw at all. No thaw Now, if all. anybody had been standing there, they could have been killed. So mm -hmm. that was a warning for us to get out. But the disciples stayed there until the exorcism was over. And these people had white robes on. Mm -hmm. We were bundled up. Sweaters, heat pads under us, uh, top coats, hats. These monks will go in zero weather under a waterfall, under a waterfall with just a sheet on. They will walk out and they will dry themselves through mind over matter. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, That's amazing. Okay, can I see I the don't, next I one? don't think I'm going to try that. No, 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 no. That takes a, a tremendous discipline, Tony. That's our interpreter. What a beautiful girl. Uh, What's that, her name? That's Rako. Rako? That's Rako, yes. That's the one Ed was chasing around all the time? <laughs> no. He okay, did so like her, though. She was a very sweet, nice girl. And this picture is what? Okay. Now, on the other side of the tunnel, Tony, uh, this is a memorial, a Buddhist memorial that has been put up by people. And they come there and they pay homage. They light these little candles. They you know, the same as we probably do in our Catholic faith. They leave flowers and like that, mainly for the people who have been killed, mm -hmm. you know, and ran into so, so terrible mis misfortune. Okay, now some of these are going to go into an exorcism, Here's Tony. Here's another one. Here's another now, one. this is an exorcism that we're involved with. At the temple. Uh, this is a Buddhist shrine. And uh, Lorraine is standing at the entrance of it right now. Uh, when we entered, there were at least uh, four what they call disciples. And uh, there was one man who was a master of uh, karate and judo. Uh, what would they call him? Martial arts. Like a Martial sensei. arts. Sensei. Right. Yes. He is not a man that you would fool around with, Tony. Could I see the next one? Yes. He was there to protect the priests. Oh, that's us with the, th that's the head Buddhist exorcist there. Now, um, that's the Reverend. That's Reverend June's wife. That's Reverend June's wife. Yes. Do you remember now Reverend she's June? she's bald-headed, but... Yeah, vaguely. Yes. That's a sign of that she is not vain. But this well, woman that here... That's, 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 yes, that's what... Yes. ...is a very holy, pious, All and knowledgeable individual. Beautiful, Next. beautiful person. Reverend June has passed away. Reverend June is a man. Is that the karate master right yes, there? Yes, that's the karate master. Kneeling down? He is a master, yes. Yes, yes. Gentle, very. These people are so gentle. They're so honorable. I, I mean, in general, I'm talking the Japanese people. But to be with these people and to be in this temple, oh, that was just absolutely wonderful. Now, remember that we can't speak Japanese. Mm. They can't speak English. But somehow, we got, we got the word through, and we had our interpreter with us. But... You talk, as like Lorraine said, very gentle people. You can't imagine dropping bombs on them, and I'm sure they couldn't imagine oh, no. dropping bombs on us. All you have to do, Tony, is to be with people like this for a week, your so-called enemies, and suddenly you're not enemies anymore. Yeah. You're friends, and we'll always be friends with them. Oh, Next, yeah. Please. But, um, you know, I would look at the little children, and I would leave people. The first one be, oh, yeah, there she is again with Ed and I. And that's, like Ed said, that's Reverend June's wife, the Reverend, and she is wonderful. Her husband came here about eight years ago mm -hmm. yes, he and did. performed an exorcism. In Massachusetts, In honey. Massachusetts and, and helped I worked, us with that. I worked with him. This what is the right, here? that's the right of exorcism, Tony, in the Buddhist temple. You see two uh, people there, they're under possession right now. One by uh, what we call a snake demon. This person would slither along the floor, the tongue darting in and out, acting just like a snake. But these people here are so knowledgeable. You know, you talk about a Catholic priest going in and performing an exorcism. He's like a child compared to them. Oh, you can't Their knowledge me. is so great. Uh, so much uh, more do they know than any priest in the United States. But they have different methods. Mm -hmm. But as I often said, their exorcisms... Their prayers go to the same God our exorcisms do. Mm -hmm. We just we call them by different names. We've got about 
two and a half minutes left, so maybe we'd like to just finish these slides up. All on, right, on go this ahead. Show. Go ahead, Tony. So what is this one? This same. And now this is uh, this again is during uh, the Buddhist exorcism. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is the very beginning stages of it, right there, okay. where they three of them on that side were kneeling and uh, uh, starting the they're players. Blindfolded. They're all yes, blindfolded. They're, they're, blindfolded. they're blindfolded, Tony, because the eyes are the mirror of the soul. And what are is in the eyes of those people you don't want to see. Right. No, right. no, no, you don't. All right. This is her again? That's, yes, that's the Reverend June and the okay, Martial let's, Arts let's Master. Let's go on to the next yes. picture. And that's at the end, after they have cast the spirits, or done what they could to cast the spirits out, uh -huh. then they build this bonfire, Tony, yep. supposedly to help the spirits to leave and to go off into the heather whatever the okay. ethnic Into yes the ether world. Or the, now these Who are, are these two guys this is us in the goya at the spot where ed was 55 years before at the very same time tell now me that's us today where, you guys oh, of course now if you go now to the next oh wait a minute next picture is let's let's get the next picture this this is ed and i who's that that's no, that's you, Lorraine. That's, that's not me. That's, you, that's, you, that's, Lorraine. that's me. not me, Lorraine. No, that's that's you know me. All right, wait. I, don't, I know he. I don't think he can get both, but look at this, huh? That's that is as we looked uh, at that look time. At that. How old were you there, Ed? How old? Nineteen. Eighteen. You, you, eighteen years yeah, old. Yeah, you were still after. eighteen, and I was eighteen. And we were week, both. It was only a week after this picture was taken that I was a survivor. Uh, I was on a ship. Uh, which was going out on a convoy out to the North Atlantic. When one of the ships rammed our ships, it caught on fire. A lot of, a lot of Navy People. men died that day. And uh, well, this shows, February 5th. This show is dedicated to them also. Uh, All yes, the men, it is. Well, yes, who it gave is. gave their lives. Yes. yes. We're basically out of time. But, you know, anyone who wants to write into us, uh, and Ed, especially, if anybody was in the U.S. Navy Armed Guard, 1943, 44, 45, World War II, Oh. Ed would love to hear from you guys because there's not that many of you left. No. And we just want to say, and Ed, too, that we appreciate all you did for us to, to keep us free. And it was we know it was hell. They said to Ed. We have to wrap it up. Okay. P.O. Box 41. Monroe, Monroe, Connecticut. Monroe, Connecticut. For Ed Warren, for Lorraine Warren, for Charter Cable, I'm Tony Sparrow. Have a wonderful evening. In this episode of Secrets of the Supernatural, moderator Tony Sparrow introduces guests Adi, Ed Warren, and Lorraine Warren, who discuss a haunting that Adi experienced in her home after living there for 15 years. The Warrens were called in to investigate strange phenomena, including knocking, rapping, and footsteps, which affected not only Adi and her family, but also guests at her bed and breakfast. The house, built in 1889, had a long history of haunting, with previous occupants experiencing unsettling events, including a group of evacuees who fled after encountering something sinister on the second floor. As the Warrens delved deeper into the investigation, they uncovered that the renovations in the house may have triggered the spirit activity. Adi recounts terrifying experiences, including doors opening mysteriously and footsteps in the attic, leading her to believe that something malevolent was present. The situation escalated when a priest they brought in for help became possessed, highlighting the severity of the demonic presence in the home. Adi describes how the haunting followed them outside the property, causing distress and fear. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Seekers of the Supernatural. I'm your moderator, Tony Spera, along with special guest Adi and Ed Warren and Lorraine Warren. Tonight, Addie is going to talk about a haunting that occurred to her in her home that she had lived in previously for about 15 years. Suddenly, phenomena began to occur, and she'll tell us all about it tonight, and she had to call in the Warrens, of course. I think what I'd like to start out before I talk to Addie, thanks for coming on, Addie, is to ask Lorraine and Ed about the house itself to set up how you got the call and what happened in the home prior to you going in. Well, Addie had contacted us and told us about phenomena that was occurring 
in this home. Mm -hmm. At that time, Addie was running it as a bed and breakfast. It's a beautiful old home, beautiful furnishings, and told us about things that were occurring, not just to her, her two children, and her husband, but also to people who would be guests in the home. They would hear the knocking, they would hear the rapping, they would hear the footsteps in the home. The home is a very old home, extremely old home, and Tony, it's not only is it an old home, but it's also on a very old route going mm -hmm. through an area in the Litchfield Hills. How old is the home? Uh, 1809. 1909? 1809. 1809. 1809, Tony. Okay, so it's like 100 and whatever, 80. Right, older, and they, they were renovating it back to its original, um, all of it, the, the stripping, the wallpaper, they were doing a great deal. Many times we know that when you start to do things where you're making renovations in a home, that that is enough to trigger off-spirit sure. phenomena, mm -hmm. uh, where a ghost or someone had once been able to walk through a doorway in a certain area, and now that doorway no longer exists. And with Addie, many changes had taken place in this home. Plus the fact that she had a couple of daughters too, children. She, no, she has a boy and a girl. A boy and a girl. Yeah, uh, she has a boy so and you a girl. Think, uh, what do you think then spawned this occurrence? Well, I think what gave it the energy, mm -hmm. I think the renovations in the house, I think the fact of the energy from the two children would be enough for the, for the spirit phenomena to feed off from and enable it to become uh, manifest to the extent that it did. But I believe that things were happening there before you even moved in, right? Oh, yes. Because uh, you had got statements from people. Uh, the house had been haunted for a history of well over 30 years before we bought the house. Mm -hmm. When we were looking at the house with the real estate agent, we noticed that there were two staircases and one of the doorways leading up to the front staircase had been nailed shut. Mm -hmm. And no one had lived on the second floor for 30 years. That's not good. One of the windows of the bedroom was broken and vines had grown in through the window and all throughout the whole bedroom. So nobody ever went up there? No one did, except in 1955, there was a great flood in the Torrington area and these people had taken in people from the Torrington area, friends of theirs, 40 of them, and let them live on the second floor. These people had no place to go, and after a week, they came downstairs, they all left, they fled. They said there was something on the second floor that didn't want them up there, mm -hmm. and they left. And other phenomena happened, and, and, but we didn't know about it at the time when we bought the house. They sold it to us without telling us about that. Uh, so we got a bargain. We got a beautiful federal colonial, 1809, 44 acres for $60,000. Wow. How many and acres? 44. Six, 44 acres for And what 60. year did you buy the home? Bought it 20 years ago. So uh, like 1976, 77? My God. It was a house, very good price. I'll cheap, give her 45000 right? yes. <laughs> You're right. Well, we were wondering what was wrong with the house. My husband went through it thoroughly and couldn't find anything structurally wrong with the house. And, and we your moved husband's in, a carpenter, right? Uh, an engineer, but he worked his way through college as a, oh. a carpenter. Uh, we moved into the house, and we had a big argument. I told him, I said, stop leaving the doors open. You're letting the dogs out. He said, I'm not leaving the doors open. He said, you're leaving the doors open. Wow. And this argument went back and forth, and then he pointed to the back door. He said, I can lock this door, turn my back on it in this room, then turn around, and this door's open. And so that night, we went around, and we locked up every window, every door in the house. And as we went to bed, my husband said, I feel that we're locking something in with us. We're not locking something out. And then that morning, we got up, and we came downstairs. Every door was open, every door. And the dogs were out on the lawn, and we became hysterical. We didn't know what was opening the doors. We, we couldn't understand what was happening in the house. It had to be somebody from inside then, right? No, oh, oh, without, without okay. a doubt. We how, realized there was something in the house with us. How long after you moved into this start? Immediately. 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 Uh, we, we bought it during the summer. We were go getting into fall. It was getting colder. We didn't know what was happening. And I just remember one day I just stood in the dining room and I said, I don't know who's opening the doors, but if you don't stop, I'll go next door, because we do live next door to a Catholic church. And I said, I'll bring a priest over and I'll have him bless the house. And then the doors stayed closed, but we had other phenomena that happened. We had footsteps up in our attic and it was terrifying. We could just hear a heavy 
footsteps going back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And my husband. Like a heavy man. Yes, I remember very that. I remember loud, that. Loud, even mm -hmm. steps. When was and it? Like in the daytime or nighttime? Daytime, nighttime, uh, but up in the attic. And my husband would insist on going up there, and I would beg him not to go up there, and he, we'd never find anything up there. And sometimes you had to beg him to go up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he was pretty fearless about about uh, making confrontations with it. I, I was terrified. I was beginning to realize that that it wasn't a person we were dealing with. In his mm -hmm. mind, he was still hoping to find uh, a, a person that he could attribute this to. Sure. Because uh, uh, after we bought the house, we we did have people come back. They thought it still belonged to the previous owners, and we had to change the locks. And, and so we were finding real people in the house. And he was hoping he was going to find a, a child or, or or kid breaking into Trying the to house. Trying think logically. Yes, yes. We we always tried to, to base all the problems on the house to, to something in reality first. Uh, we would have the piano play and we would run into the library and it would stop and we would think well maybe the cat walked across it but but it sounded like classical music how could the cat do that uh... we had loud explosive noises in the house followed by breaking glass and we could find no explanation for those either and we thought well you maybe didn't there's an you underground didn't find no broken glass either right we thought maybe there's an underground cave and then my husband thought well maybe we're going through a time warp or something we, we never really thought about in in the terms of a, of a ghost a haunting or a demon uh, then we started, I started to see people in the house. I saw a previous owner that died. Uh, I saw a, a woman in Victorian tell, clothes. Tell, tell us, tell our viewers about that time when that man appeared. That two, two weeks after the previous owner died, shortly after we bought our home, I saw him in the kitchen and he looked completely opaque, completely alive. I could see his clothing, he had something in his hand. He was walking over to the sink. And I was astonished because I knew he was dead and here he was still in the kitchen alive and we had a puppy then and he jumped up on me and I looked down for one instant at the puppy and I looked up and he had vanished and I backed out of the kitchen and my face said it all. My husband looked at me and says, you've seen a ghost. He said, you've seen the previous owner that died. And I said, how did you know? He said, I felt his presence in the house. I felt him looking over my shoulder while we were doing renovations. And uh, wow. it's, yeah, but his, his spirit didn't stay around long. It was just there for a short mm -hmm. time uh, after he died. It wasn't a frightening experience, except that, that whenever you have to deal with any supernatural event, even a good person that dies, it comes back. It's so startling. Very startling. And, it and is. You, you just don't expect to have these encounters. I mean, you just, you're trying to take out the trash. You're trying to get on with your life. I, I remember Ed asked us, uh, uh, after these events, what did you do? And I said, well, uh, Bobby went off to work. You still have to pay the mortgage. I, I would mow the lawn. We just went on with our lives. You would take really... a long time mowing the lawn, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, we, we didn't spend as much time in the house as, as we would have liked to. I would never, ever sleep in the house alone. Uh, I would have friends or neighbors come and stay with me. That's why you but... made it a B&B, &B, right? Uh, yes. Well, it was hard having the guests come down because I was really hoping that uh, we could blame the whole thing on, on mental illness. We needed a vacation, it's an old house, we're hearing things, and to have the guests come down in the morning and say that they saw someone in their room or, or had some other supernatural event happen, mm -hmm. uh, then we were beginning to realize that we, we had to do something. This uh, was bearing out everything that you experienced. Yes, yes, and the more guests that we had in the house, the more activity we had, until the footsteps were no longer in the attic. Now the footsteps were coming into our bedroom. And I can't tell you how frightening that was. The first time I heard these footsteps and they weren't up in the attic, I thought someone's broken into the house and they're very bold because they don't mind making enough noise to wake us up. And because of the children, we put all the handguns away. So I thought, well, there's just no way I can get to the closet, load a handgun, and, and you know take care of this intruder. So I thought, I'll just lay in bed very still and I'll just open my eyes enough to see him. And when he comes over the threshold, I'll have to rush him. And then I'll scream out for my husband, and maybe the two of us can subdue him. And the astonishment when the footsteps continued in the room, but I couldn't see anything. And I sat up in the room, and I could still hear the footsteps. And they went around, they stopped on my husband's side of the bed. And I woke him up, and he said, I heard them too. And I said, what are we going to do about this? And someone said, well, there's some Ghostbusters, and they didn't know where you were, and I ended up calling a local paper, and they told me where I could find you. And, and when you arrived, it, it was wonderful to just be able to pour out all these stories of things that happened in the house, have someone finish a sentence for me, to understand what we were going through, to not think we were crazy, to finally get over the denial of everything that we had lived for all those years of trying not to accept it. But the clincher came when you said that, yes, we had ghosts in the house, but we also had a demonic spirit. That I wasn't willing to accept. I think I told you to finish your team, get out. That's when you grabbed your rosary beads. <laughs> well, we were not Catholics at the time. No. We were Protestants. 
And uh, as Protestants, uh, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the devil. Um, evil it was just thought of something that could be within a person, that it was not an outside entity. This was something that uh, the Catholic Church used to hold their congregation. You know, oh, Satan will get you, and, and, and you have to do is what we said. And I had a lot of trouble uh, believing that. And when you left, I told Bobby, I said, well, they're just trying to frighten us. Uh, you know, I don't really believe in an e evil spirit. And 10 days after I sent you away, I, I remember I, I called you and I begged you to come back. back. I was willing then to accept it on your terms that, yes, that there was this spirit in the house that had never been a human being that was there purely as evil and wanted to destroy us if not possess us first. Uh, uh, that was a, a, a big thing to accept. It, it was, a, you had it was a, a frightening a thing. You had a Catholic priest that came in there and got possessed, right? Yes, yes he did. He, he came to help us and, and the poor man ended up becoming possessed. I was cooking dinner and I told him he could stay. And uh, his head just flew down onto the kitchen table and made this loud bang, and I thought, now he's had a heart attack. He's, he's come here to help us, and now he's died. And I thought, oh, I'll have to call the ambulance. It's such a terrible thing to cope with. And then he lifted his head up from the table, and, <gasps> and his eyes were glowing red, and I thought, no, he's possessed. And, and I said, Father, are you all right? And he said, I'm fine, dear. When's dinner? And then his head went thunk down on the kitchen table. He makes this gasping noise. His head comes up again. His eyes are glowing red. This happened three times. And I, I was very frightened for him. It, you know, dealing with a, a demonic spirit is not for everyone. And I should say that the three times has meaning because it's an insult to the Trinity. See, the thing that she's described, this uh, priest uh, that happened? she's talking about. That's better what it finally happened. Yeah. Well, well we, we had to, he came back to help us again and, and and but he wasn't good, really the parish he priest. That? Uh, no, he was not. He was not the parish priest next door. No, no, we didn't even bring it up to him. He he came to help us, and and I realize that. But not everyone has a calling to deal with the demonic right. spirits. He may have a special calling somewhere else in the church, mm -hmm. but only a very special person can be mm -hmm. an exorcist. Uh, it, it's just this thing was so evil that immediately it, it, it wanted to take a priest. That what better defilement it could do than to possess a priest. And, mm -hmm. and I realized that what we had in the house was far more dangerous than, than anything that we supposed in the past. That, that if it could do this to a priest, what could it do to us? And it did do horrible things to us. It was, what uh, other things did it do? Uh, well, my, my husband wanted to see it. He said everyone's seeing things in the house, manifestations. Uh, we had psychic photographers in the house. We had investigators. They were seeing things. He said, I, I know it's here. I feel it's present. I want to see it. So we took him out to this L, which is off the back of our house. It's unheated. And we knew that this was a special place to this, this monster in our home because even unheated, one day I brought Lorraine out there. It was about 20 below. That's not wind chill factor. It was an actual 20 below where we were. Uh, There's an area the size of a basketball, just a space of, of uh, um, air. Mm -hmm. And if you stuck your hand in it, it was like sticking in a furnace. Now it had been like that since we bought the house. But, you know, being in denial, being wow. such a disturbing thing. It's like it was I a just, hot pipe right there. Like yeah. a hot section. Just, but there just, was no just way. Just a that, round section. Yeah. Everything else would be freezing down below. There was no way for it to get any kind of heat source in there. And I remember L Lorraine stuck her hand into it, and then she couldn't get her hand back out. And I remember she pulled her hand back out, and I, and I could see a little fear in her face. And I thought, this is terrible because these people are here to help us. And, and even here, she was showing a little fear towards it. And uh, it, it was just a horrifying thing. So we went out to that part of the L, and we didn't have to wait long. Two green fluorescent balls of light appeared. They danced around. They joined together, mm -hmm. approached us, and then disappeared. Ghost lights. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the next minute, I thought, well, where did it go? And I looked to my husband, and he was glowing green. And he stood up, and then he got a darker fluorescent green, and, and he was like this. And I realized he was no longer in his body, and suspended on the right side of his body in, in white was like his soul. It, it was a little bit smaller, like it would fit into his physical body. And I could see, and a psychic investigator was with us, and I had completely lost at this point. I was backed up against the wall screaming. Out of everything that happened in the house, this had gone too far. It was by invitation. He wanted to see it. Now it had the right to possess him. And this man threw holy water on him, and, and my husband was restored to himself. And it was just a very horrifying thing. He said he remembered throughout the whole thing that I was telling him to tell it in the name of Jesus Christ to go away. But I didn't say that. And I said to Bobby, I said, someone was telling you that, perhaps your guardian angel, but it wasn't me. I assure you, I was screaming and I had lost it through the whole thing. But uh, uh, that was just one of the horrifying incidences that happened wow. in the house. I'm trying to think how far into our investigation, Addie, um, that we brought um, 
the bishop to your home to exercise it? About six months after I first met you, uh, I was introduced to, to this Catholic bishop, mm -hmm. uh, a traditional Catholic bishop, and bishop I remember... Robert McKenna. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I met him in the basement of his church, and I asked him to help us. And he said that he would be happy to help out. He had a couple of engagements. He'd be right over. And he said something wonderful. He said, and he won't be harmed between now and then. And he said it was such assurance. I thought, well, this has mm -hmm. got to be the man. And I said, we have everything packed up. We have beautiful antiques. We had them all packed up in boxes. Uh, we had permission to, from the church next door to use their hall to store our things so that they wouldn't be destroyed during the exorcism and trying to remove this evil spirit that in the past had sent things flying around the house and, <coughs> and smashing, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, no. He said, put everything back. He said, I never get any breakage. And then he stood mm -hmm. up, and I kissed his ring, and I thought, he's a giant. He's so tall that his head had to be bent because he would have bumped the top of the ceiling in his basement. And I left with two psychic investigators, and I said, he's a giant. He's the tallest man I've ever seen. And they said, no, he's shorter than yourself, Addie. He and is. I said, he's, he's huge. And they said, he gets larger when he has to deal with the demonic. That's transfiguration. So, well, I thought, all right, I've seen many strange things in my house, but this I was not going to accept. The strange so, things that I saw usually were dealt with supernatural beings. This was a human being. And I thought, I just imagined him being larger than life because he said he could help us. Yes, and then I thought, in well, your I, mind, I, I knelt was. down, and even though I didn't know how to treat a Catholic bishop, I still kissed his ring. And I thought, as I knelt down, he just looked larger because I was looking up at him. Right. So when he arrived at our home, of course, he was short. Yeah. And then he He's started. To, yes, he was in a hurry. He, he mentioned he had some other place to go. He starts out in this Latin exorcism, exorcism in Latin, and as he's reading along, nothing's happening. And I thought, well, this is another dead end. And we had gone through so many avenues. I thought, this just isn't working. There's no manifestations. We don't see it trying to <coughs> battle this man or anything. And then I looked over this bishop, and he's enormous. He was as tall as my husband. My husband's six foot four. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say something, and my husband signaled me. He says, no, I see it too. But don't say anything. Don't interrupt him. It's working. And I have to say, it was much better after the first exorcism. It was now out on the lawn, mm -hmm. and very rarely was it back into the house. And he, then he came back a year and a half later, and then he re-exercised the house again. Once again, he shows up his, his normal height, a little shorter than myself. This time, I thought, I'm not going to take my eyes off of him. I'm going to stand behind him. I'm not going to even blink. I am going to look at the back of this man's head. And he starts off in the Latin exorcism, and then he grew in front of me in three stages. It was like stop-action photography. He was like in a blur, and then he stopped, and he was a little taller. Then a blur, and then he stopped, and he was crystal clear, a little taller. And then a third time, a blur, and he stopped. And then I started to black out. This was just like such an incredible thing that I had seen. And then I thought, no, I have to get a hold of myself because it's working now. And I felt that he, he had God's ear, and I made a full confession. I said, God, I am not worthy. I know that you didn't help us 100% in the first exorcism, but we made changes in our life. And although I'm a sinner, I said, please, for the children's sake, because we were going to lose our home. I'd already told Ed that if we didn't get this thing out of the home, once and for all, I was going to burn it down. Another person was not going to have to live in that house with what we lived in. And I said, please, for the children, do this. And, I, and then I made this an afterthought. I said, I'll raise them as Catholics. <laughs> and tears started pouring down my eyes. Now, I have a medical condition. I don't make tears. I have to use my own artificial tears. So, and right down the middle of my eyes, tears just started to come down. And I just felt like I was in the presence of God. And he was so awesome. And he was so beautiful. And he was truth and he was justice, and he let me know that everything was going to be all right. And my husband comes up to me, and he says, you're crying. And that kind of just broke this, this audience that I had with God. And I said, yes, and it's beautiful. And I thought, the floor, the floor must be soaked. How long did I stand here and cry? And I looked out the floor, and the floor was dry, but I was still crying. And I realized as the tears left my face, they were disappearing. Really? It was so beautiful. And then we finished up with the exorcism, and the whole house just filled full of this beautiful smell of perfume. And I knew then it was the odor of sanctity that it had worked. We all smelled it. It was just the most awesome mm. thing. It really was. It was, uh, wow, it was just wonderful. Wow, beautiful experience. Yeah. And then Bishop McKenna, yeah. he, he goes for the door. And I said, I said, do you know that you get taller when you're here, when you're doing the exorcism? And he just smiled, got into a subcompact car. He didn't push the seat back, crammed himself <laughs> in, and drove off, and, and that was that. Well, I'll tell you, that man is a giant spiritually. He is. Uh, the strange thing about Bishop McKenna is that I've been with him for a whole day and a night, and I never see him take food. 
Of course, I was probably eating his share. <laughs> he will but not take I've food. Never, never seen He'll take a little meat. water, maybe a little bread, you know, when he's doing an exorcism. Mm -hmm. But he will not take any he food. He will never. He and never I wonder, how does this man live? You know, he weighs about 135 pounds. You know, he does stand about 5'8". And uh, I, he spiritually, he's a giant, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've seen him do things with Bill Ramsey, who was the werewolf in London. I've seen him do things with uh, Maurice Theriol. Maurice Theriol to, uh, it was a terrible exorcism. The man's head split open in front of us, blood coming down the face, out of the eyes, out of the mouth. And Bishop McKenna helped him for at least eight years, but he went back into his old ways again and he was possessed again. But that had nothing to do with Bishop McKenna. No. You know, this man is, is probably the, the holiest, pious bishop and priest that I've ever come across. And I've come across a lot of them. Yeah, he's well, a very beautiful person. Well, talking about not eating, we had not realized that, that he had fasted. He and, yes, and, he always and the, does. the sisters, he has some Dominican uh, nuns with him, uh, had fasted for three days. Did he bring the Dominican nuns uh, to your home? No, but he, he has uh, now, not, not during the exorcism, but uh, when we realized that they fasted, we, we now have a, a yearly dinner for them, and oh, they all come nice. over and, and enjoy everything. And it's, uh, yeah, they are. They're really, truly wonderful people. They're, they're, and, uh, and you don't have to worry eight years down. Down the road, but right. I'm going to fall back into my old old ways, and the house is going to be repossessed because we've now converted to Catholicism. Well, I have to tell you something well, too, Eddie. Yeah. You know, the first time we met you, you were an entirely different person. You, I mean, if I crossed past you in the street, I would not recognize you. No, we did. I was unhappy. Yes. Uh, there was no question about no. that. Uh, it, it was just uh, such a change for me to go through all this. It changed like that. I, I, I well, none of us, uh, none of us would recognize you. I don't think no. you would recognize her, Tony. I, I, I didn't recognize him. God, but I didn't worship him, and, and my <coughs> life just didn't have the meaning that it should. I mean, beyond my, my children, which were very precious to me, but uh, to, to be given that assurance at that time uh, with the second exorcism, to know that no matter what trials I'm going to have in my life, that everything's going to turn out well, right. Well, you see, the, the, the thing I think that's important here with Hattie's, with Addie's case is the fact of how God works in mysterious ways. Now, like Addie said, her life was certainly not on track for quite a while, and, mm -hmm. but she was always bubbly and personable like she is right now, but... You call that bubbly and personable? <laughs> I thought she was a little morose tonight. <laughs> very Talking quiet. very slowly. Uh, well, a lot, a lot slower than before. It was, well, I think what was so frightening about it is we didn't know when it was going to end, and no. uh, it, it had gone beyond what was happening in the house. Now it was following us off the property. We had incidences off the property, too. What happened? And, uh, well, a car tried to run me over, a car that was completely... I remember that. Completely stopped. It just, on its own volition, on, on a completely level area, with no keys in or anything, came after me. And, and I attributed that to everything that was going That's on diabolical. to the house. Mm -hmm. And, and then o other attacks. But some things have happened to me that... that that I'll never discuss or share with anybody. I mean, whatever was in the house uh, could rummage through your mind and, and, and just do horrible things to you that it knew only you would find horrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I remember personally from my, myself, one time I, I went to go pick up uh, um, meat at the meat locker and they were butchering rabbits. And I never thought rabbits ever made any sound, except when they were killing them. They, they made these horrible squeals, and that stayed with me. Yeah. And the thing in the house knew that that bothered me. And occasionally on the lawn, after I'd been tossed off onto the lawn by Bishop McKenna, would chase me around at night if I tried to go out to the barn to tend my animals, and it would make that sound. It, it would just know how to reach into you and, and find the mm -hmm. things that bothered you the most and confront you with them. Mm -hmm. that's and a that's a death squeal of a rabbit. That is, that is very true, what, what you are about. saying. I have to say also, Tony, that this home, um, now I haven't been there for a period of time, but it's, it, they, they have furnished it all in the period. Oh, and, really? Oh, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful, beautiful. I mean, her furniture is beautiful and all antiques and all her china and silver. Wow. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely. So basically, though, Addie, the phenomena <coughs> has basically stopped. Is that what you're saying? You know, it's not really going on right now? Uh, well, uh, about a year after the exorcism, we had a, a loud crash on the front door every couple of months. And the only explanation that we can have for it, it sounded like a car driven into the house, was that it was coming back and <coughs> testing. 
uh, you know, could that, it come that's back? That's how in? people describe just what you described. Like the bell house in the Newtown. The bell house in Newtown, they said right? A truck crashed right through the the pantry, and everything just smashed and broke. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's nothing broken. Wow. Uh, what it, when, when people, if you tell somebody this, you know, friends or something, how do they accept it? They, they don't. Uh, the neighbors don't let their children come over and play with ours. No, they don't. <laughs> uh, people think that uh, uh, we're strange. Uh, my own parents asked me if my husband and I were doing drugs. Yep. Uh, we went through a very terrible time. Uh, it was everything that we went through. The house was bad enough, but to have people not believe us, uh, to think that we were strange or, or that we had uh, um, made it up for whatever reasons. Uh, oh, yeah. We homeschool the children now. They got teased in school. We took them out. Wow. It well, made you know, quite a big change in our life. One of the first life. things, Addie, that people say to us, I'm so happy that somebody understands and they believe us. Mm -hmm. I thought we were going crazy. I did. As a matter of fact, I was really hoping that, that when you and Lorraine came, you would sit down and say, there's nothing wrong with your house. You, you know, you need to see a doctor. See a psychiatrist. Yes, yes. And, and I really didn't want to hear the truth. And when you told it to me, I, I guess I reacted like most people do, with anger mm -hmm. and, and just such astonishment and denial uh, to, uh, to be told this. And, but all along, I knew that it was the truth. But, but it's amazing what the mind can do mm -hmm. to itself, uh, how people, when they're under such duress, can, sure. can take things and just twist them around or put them up on a shelf in the closet and say, I'm not going to touch this. Oh, sure. I'm not going to think about it. We're just about out of time, but I'd like to say thank you, Eddie, for coming all the way out here from where you live. Uh -huh. And we want to come for supper because we know you make a good supper. So about 8 o'clock tomorrow we'll be there. <laughs> well, um, I wanted to uh, uh, thank everyone for watching, and I don't want them to be afraid to come forward. I, I know that I, initially I was, and, mm -hmm. and initially we took some flack from the neighbors, but it, it's how you feel about yourself. To, sure. to live with the truth is sure. the most important thing. So Eddie, I'd like to you wonderful. I'd like to thank you also for coming out tonight. I really do. Thank you, um, Eddie. So for those that need your address, uh, Rob will probably put it up on the screen, but we're really short on time. So it's P.O. Box 41 in Monroe, Connecticut, 06468. Write us letters. Call us up. Do what you need to do if you've got a problem or any questions. Until next time, for Lorraine Warren, for Ed Warren, for Addie, I'm Tony Sparrow. Thank you. Throughout history, the question of vampires' existence has captivated imaginations. Stories of these mysterious, blood-drinking creatures span centuries and cultures, each one adding to the allure and mystery of the vampire legend. Let's start with a bit of history. Long before the vampires of Hollywood, ancient civilizations spoke of entities that rose from their graves to drink the blood of the living. In Eastern Europe, legends of vampires were so strong that villagers would go to great lengths to protect themselves. Sometimes they'd even exhume bodies and drive stakes through their hearts to ensure the dead would stay dead. These were real fears, not just bedtime stories. But what could have sparked such terror some scientists suggest that medical conditions might be behind these legends. For example, porphyria, a rare blood disorder, causes extreme sensitivity to sunlight, leading to blistering skin and a preference for darkness. This disorder can also make gums recede, which might have given some people a fang-like appearance. Additionally, rabies, a disease that can make people highly sensitive to light, garlic, and water, could have fueled some of the myths. Still, other theories suggest that vampire stories may have emerged as a way to explain unexplained deaths and plagues. When diseases spread rapidly, people often turn to supernatural explanations. Bodies exhumed shortly after death sometimes appeared surprisingly well-preserved due to natural processes that people didn't fully understand. To them, it seemed as if these corpses weren't dead at all. This undead appearance could easily lead to suspicions of vampirism. Then there's the psychological aspect. Vampires represent forbidden desires, immortality, and power. They offer the allure of eternal life, which is something humanity has always dreamed of. It's no wonder that stories of vampires have lasted so long, evolving from ancient fears to modern-day fascination. So, are vampires real? Most would say no, that they are simply myths shaped by misunderstanding and fear. But let's see what the Warrens think about vampires. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another edition of Seekers of the Supernatural. I'm your moderator, Tony Spera. Tonight, 
we'll be speaking about mysterious places, monsters, and the Count Dracula. I know a lot of you are familiar with the Dracula movies with Bela Lugosi, Lon Chaney Jr., those kind of things. Is that Hollywood fantasy? Is that something just for our entertainment? Or do vampires really exist? Tonight, we're going to answer that question. Ed, I'd like to ask you about vampires just to start right off. Are there such a thing as vampires, and can you tell me an example of one? Positively, uh, vampires do exist, what we call human vampires. The human uh, vampire is a person who hallucinates, imagines himself as a vampire, and takes on that role. These are not the true Hollywood-type vampire, but there are cases, uh, such as the Calbani case, back in 1953 in Old Greenwich Farm Cemetery, where the Calbani family had to open up a grave, mm -hmm. and uh, they, a family member had died, and they were saving a little money by digging the grave themselves. Mm -hmm. but when they got down about four foot, they struck a coffin, which shouldn't be there. It was their private plot. The coffin was of an antique nature. They opened it up, and inside was a man about 45 years old, and he was fresh to the touch as though he had just been buried. Hmm. Now. The law states that even though it's your plot in a cemetery, you can't exhume the body until you get a court order. Well, it took about a week to get that court order. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, the mother of the family went back and had the ground consecrated. And then they dug up the grave again, and this time, when they opened it up, inside was a corpse that looked as though it had been buried for many, many years, just a skeleton. The coffin itself had greatly deteriorated. Mm -hmm. At the time, it made quite a hullabaloo in the newspapers, and people wondered, was this a vampire? Well, it was a vampire, but the man was not dead when he was put into that coffin. He was a sorcerer, a black magician. He had put himself into a catatonic state, still mm -hmm. alive, just barely. Mm -hmm. Friends of his had him buried, but at night, he would leave that coffin with the astral body, very much the same way that people who are on, on, uh, on a um, operating table leave their physical body, look down, see the doctors and the nurses. This like a, man like would a leave, experience. right, this man would leave during the psychic hours, nine to six, and he would go in search of blood, but he would not bite into anybody's neck. He could take the blood through what we call teleportation, apports. Now today, of course, with all the ways that somebody could get blood, a vampire doesn't have to attack anybody to get that blood. But while the physical body is still alive, there's a silver cord, a supernatural cord, that emanates from the physical body to the astral body. Mm -hmm. No matter how far away that astral body goes, if you go 3,000 miles, that cord would still be attached. It's only when that cord, that supernatural cord is broken that death comes to that physical body. Mm -hmm. The blood that the vampire would get would be transferred through that cord, that silver cord, much like a straw, would go back into the physical body, which was in the grave, and this would rejuvenate the body and keep it alive. That's a true vampire today. But, you know, a lot of people wonder about Count Dracula. Well, now we're going to Transylvania. Mm -hmm. Is there such a place as Transylvania? There oh, is, yes. isn't there? Transylvania is part of Romania. It's in the Carpathian Mountains. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, we want to plan a trip probably next year going to the Carpathian Mountains and seeing what's left of Dracula's castle. Oh, wow. And I want you to come with me, Tony. Okay. I'm game. And <laughs> we will be on an exploring trip there. And I had a very dear, dear friend we did, um, Dr. Devandri Varma from India. He had traveled all over the world in search of vampire cases and had mm -hmm. written many books to the extent that he was knighted by the, by the Queen of England for his work in that. Mm -hmm. Dr. McNally and Dr. Florescu, two professors here in America, had spent 15 years in Romania looking for Castle Dracula. And when they finally found it, which was high up in the Carpathian Mountains, 
it was in such a remote area that very few people ever go there. Dr. McNally, looking for this castle, had told Lorraine and I that he was so stunned by what they had found and a little shaken up that he didn't really go into the castle ruins hmm. because it's high up about maybe a thousand feet up on top of a mountain. Yeah, a this is the first year that he found it. He never entered, he never that, entered that castle. His, his son, in fact, after all the years of research, his son entered the castle for the first time before he did because it had such a negative, profound effect on him. Now, there was a real Count, Count Dracula. Dracula, yes, uh, Vlad Tepish, who lived during the 14th century. He was a very cruel, uh, very, very cruel man. It said that uh, he had impaled something like 10,000 enemy soldiers. And uh, when the Turkish army was coming to invade his part of Transylvania, when they seen this, they said, this man is mad. We're not attacking his castle. And they turned around and went back again. Mm -hmm. But there have been many such cases. But I think Whitby Abbey, where you've been, and Lorraine and I have been, uh, which is on the North Sea in England, was made very famous by Bram Stoker. Mm -hmm. Bram Stoker wrote the first book on Dracula. Right. And it was here at Whitby Abbey that he had his Dracula land. And uh, we've been there. We've seen some very, very mystifying things occur. Now, remember when a place like Whitby Abbey has a history of vampires, even though it's only in a book. Mm -hmm. It draws very weird people to it. Oh, yes. And they perform many different ki kinds of ceremonies. If you went to Whitby today, at the foot of the cliffs, there's a small village, which is Whitby, and it's loaded with paraphernalia of vampires. In fact, there's a, a vampire museum there. Mm -hmm. But I will never forget the many nights that Lorraine and I and small groups of people had gone there to take photographs and where the structure of Whitby Abbey has fallen all apart, there's one wall that has three windows still left, high up. One night we seen what we call the green ghost. It looked like the only way to describe this, Tony, we had a whole group of people. Now you've been to Whitby many times with us. You go down the side, you go through the arch and down the side of it, you're still like on that ground level, not, you're looking right. up right. on the abbey. Right. And we got to a point where the three windows were at one side of it, the, just the outline of what now remains, which we'll be showing later in the show. And in the middle, in the very middle window, we watched this green, well, I, I don't know how to describe it. Ghost-like except, figure. And it, it moved like a candlelight type of thing, like the flame from are. a candle. Yeah. It moved just like a flame from a candle, but mm. it was a spirit that was right in that general area at that time. And the most frustrating thing happened. Here's all of these people there to take photographs, all of our researchers that were there to take photographs. And now, this is at 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, right? yeah. Cold and windy and cold. Raw. Oh, you rain. know how cold it is there. And There's something scary about it, but it's also something that's beautiful about it. Mystically beautiful. And you can't put your finger on it, but I it's know. scary, but you love it. You know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's right. And, Tony, it doesn't matter if you're there during the day or at night. It still has that air about right. it. Right. There's still Definitely. that air. Well, you that remember it, one night... I remember one night. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> well, you gotta talk. You gotta tell the folks out there what happened to you on that night when we were wandering around Whitby Graveyard, which is right, right at the edge of a high cliff, going off into the North Sea. That's the night that a black cyclone of wind uh, mm -hmm. attacked me, probably within came within three feet, and it was about more or less. It was more like three in the morning. I remember we arrived at about two, mm -hmm. and it was only about an hour into it. We had the camera set up. We had the recorder set up and the flashlights and all that. And we had a couple of people with us, but they were off in the distance. And I remember fiddling with my camera on the tripod and getting a sense of something behind me. Mm -hmm. I had a sense that there was... First, I thought it was a, you know, another researcher, but it felt funny. I had a funny feeling. That was in the middle of the graveyard. That was in the middle of the graveyard. <coughs> I turned around and I saw probably about eight feet high 
eight feet tall, this black cyclone of wind. That's the only thing I can describe it as. Shadow ghost. A shadow ghost. And I could sense the evil, and it was drawing energy from me. And that's when I yelled for you, remember? Mm -hmm. I yelled for you to come. So I started screaming, actually, for you to come. <laughs> and you came running over with holy water, and you were saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave and go back to where you came from. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that I'll never forget. That's an experience. That is when you from. and Lorraine and a couple other people had helped carry me back to the car. Mm -hmm. Because I was just physically, oh yeah, that's emotionally it, just distraught. Well, we, were, yes. we were there last year, uh, Tony, and uh, we had a few people with us. Had a young boy; he was about 17. Mm -hmm. He was walking back to our car through the graveyard when suddenly, what we call a ghost veil, just floated right across that cemetery. Mm -hmm. Now, if these people could see Whitby Abbey Cemetery at night. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would know that this has got to be one of the weirdest places one of the weirdest. Earth. One of it the weirdest is. in the world. Oh. Huge, tall gravestones and mm -hmm. uh, the wind blowing yep. on the edge of a cliff. I can see why Bram Stoker picked, picked that it. place. I could too, definitely. Definitely. Lorraine, I'd like to ask you, I think what we should do is start to get into the slides a little bit. Talk mm -hmm. about mysterious places too, besides Whitby. How about Stonehenge? You had oh, that's some beautiful, feelings at Stonehenge Tony. that. Now, this is one of the trips that I had that we had the pleasure of having our daughter with us. You and Judy have traveled with us a great deal. You know that lady, Tony? Looks vaguely familiar to me. Uh, oh, that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but we're standing by Stonehenge. Now, the very first time, Tony, I ever, ever visited Stonehenge, it was a real profound experience. Wasn't that where you said you were re-energized? It was, I had probably close to pneumonia. It, I was there in January with a group of students, and I was miserably sick. But the following day, they were calling for snow. Mm. So the students wanted to go down to Stonehenge, no matter how I felt. So I went down with them. We went down from London where we were staying. We drove down to Stonehenge. And when I arrived, I went by the lead stone. Mm -hmm right by the lead stone, which you could see in there. And I put my hands against the stone in this manner. And Tony, it was as if I plugged in to a tremendous source of energy. I remember sharing this and how amazing it was. It was... It was almost like a shot of adrenaline, huh? It was healing. Mm -hmm. It was a very positive thing. It was a very healing thing. Just by putting my hands on those on the stone. I'd like you to do me a favor, you and Ed both when you're over there in May this month. Chip off bring, a piece of Bring me back a stone. <laughs> bring me back a stone. <laughs> well, I'd like to well the stone's only about a foot high now because <laughs> everybody's been chipping pieces off. I'd like to go, if I could, to another monster. Yes. We'll, we'll go back to stone anyway, picture. I'd well, like to see this slide of, of the Loch Ness Monster. There it is. Yes, well, let me say, Tony, that is the only other place that I felt that type of energy. And that was one night at midnight. We were near Drum the Drucket, mm -hmm. which is the far end of Loch Ness. We were directly across from where uh, Alistair Crowley's home was. Oh, yes, yes. And at that time, was Jimmy. was called the Beast. Yeah. The Beast. And Jimmy Page, you know, the drummer, he was occupying it. He was renting it at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting on the edge of Loch Ness. Now, this is the same year. That I was I think there. this next slide will show what that's you're talking a, about. That's your cart castle. That's, that's where the picture was taken. That's mm -hmm. further down Loch Ness. There we are with a group. And at that time, I felt the same type of energy there, Tony, but it felt in a way like that water was like a heartbeat. That's about just about what it looked like. But that's at 1 o'clock in the morning. On yes. That shot right there? Yes, yes. that's at 1 o'clock in the morning on Loch Ness. And it was like a giant machine, like a, a beating of a heart. That's the only way. Really? Yes, that's the only way I can describe it. Here again is another shot uh, looking down at Loch Ness from Yurkart Castle. That's the area where the Loch Ness monster had been photographed the now, most. I'd just like to interrupt for one sec. 
uh, people think like you know the Loch, like you know we have little lakes around here. Yeah, that's the They think same. maybe it's like a little fishing hole. Mm. No, Loch Ness oh. is 26 miles long. And Ed, how deep is Loch Ness? Nobody really knows how deep Loch Ness is. And the problem with finding the so-called monster is that the water is full of um, plankton to the extent that you can't even see six feet away. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what could keep something like the Loch Ness monster alive, really because you have numerous it, huge salmon in that river, or in that lock, I should mm -hmm. say. Now, this end, where we are right here, Judy and I, again, this is the far end right by St. Benedict's Monastery. Mm -hmm. Now, St. Benedict's Monastery, there is a priest that has been there over 40 years, and this particular... I have to tell you something. I have to interrupt right here. Did you just see that shot? Yes. That was a windy, cold, day. Mm -hmm. Everybody was looking for the Loch Ness Monster and I turned around and Lorraine was across the road and she was taking a picture of something. I said, Lorraine, what are you doing? She was taking pictures of bluebells. We're looking for a lo Loch Ness Monster and I never, she is taking pictures of the bluebells. Bluebell flowers. Yes. I never, I never lived <laughs> bluebells it down. Scotland. I never lived it down. I think you have about 36 pictures of bluebells too, don't yes, you? Yes. <laughs> but anyway, what's the next slide but, that we're um, going to? That's, that is Father Gregory Brucey. That is the priest who has lived, Tony, at that monastery He's a prior of, uh, the, for 40 years. And on three occasions, that man has, has witnessed the Loch Ness He's been on monster. many television shows, national mm -hmm. shows, uh, where they've interviewed him. I think one of the outstanding times was when he had a new organist. Uh, he was only at St. Benedict's probably about eight years when this new organist came in to take over and uh, they were walking down by the lock mm -hmm. and he said suddenly there was a great eruption of water mm -hmm. and they seen this huge head coming up with a snake-like neck and both of them of course were, were startled but they the man was so startled that he actually ran away and they never seen him again after that. Wow. Yeah. He wouldn't work at St. Benedict's. He Benedict. wouldn't work there. Unbelievable. No, huh? he wouldn't work there, this Father slide, told us. If I'm not mistaken and I believe the next slide would be uh, Whitby Abbey. Uh, I think the, graves, the graveyard. This is the graveyard. Oh, yes. Graveyard. Notice how tall the stones are there. And on a rainy, windy, cold night, oh. you know, with the rain glistening off these stones and dark in there. The wind blowing. That is a place that very few people would, would want to be. Uh, oh, and the next slide is Whitby Abbey. I know. Yes, that's part of, of Whitby, Whitby Abbey. That's right. part of Whitby Abbey. Yes. These are all part of, of Whitby Abbey. The old. Mm -hmm. The old abbey there. Yeah, that's a beautiful it, thing. Isn't that beautiful going up the stairs? You know how stairs? old those stairs are? How old are those stairs? They must go back, God. Uh, Wasn't the Whitby Abbey 14, built? 1500 in the years. 1400s? Yeah, 14, was it the 14th century. And I that think. usually where yeah. a monastery like that would be, there was another one before that. Yeah. Right, right. Yes. And unfortunately, the Germans uh, uh, or the um, English would spot the convoys coming through. And the Germans got the same idea. Mm -hmm. So they had lookouts at Whitby Abbey, the English. And the Germans came up with a submarine and bombarded it one time. Yeah. They blew a lot that of it was away. A, a lot of damage was done at that time when That's they did. Shame. It is a shame. It's a real shame. We have one shame. more shot, I believe, of. Yeah, now this is interesting because, you know, in a lot of these old castles and abbeys, they had dungeons. Mm -hmm. Now, when a man was put into a dungeon, there was usually water that ran nearby, which was the North Sea, of course. They would feed him some salt pork. Now, this man would slowly, slowly die of thirst. But imagine watching that water out there in the ocean, eating salt pork with your tongue swelling up, how you must have suffered. That was the cute little things they did oh, during the medieval oh, days. That was horrible. Oh, horrible things. We do have a couple of photographs here that I'd like to go over if I could, Lorraine and... Uh, we took these pictures mm -hmm. the last time we were at Whitby Abbey. A year ago, Tony. Um, I'll show the first slide of the, of, I guess this is the little coffin, a little casket, grave site. Yes. It's right there where I'm looking. Is that a child's coffin? Yeah, that's a child's, a child's coffin, hon, where mm -hmm. it was a child's coffin. Did you get any it's sensations when you were looking at that, Lorraine? Any feelings at all? Very sad feelings, Tony, I remember. Very, very, very sad feelings I had. Okay. Now, this is a, a good shot of Whitby. 
Oh, that's a right beautiful here. And there's shot. the three windows that we talked about. Oh, yes, right down there in the back. That's right. That's where we witnessed now, that you're looking ghost. off to the North Sea there. Mm -hmm. That's the, the North Sea. The next stop from there would be up in the North Pole. Wow. Well, this now, picture here. That's Tony. That's us in the corner there where there's a, a little... Like that a, stairway, Tony. That, right. Yes, where Ed photographed, closed in on it later. But that's you and I, right? And look at look at the, how the wind is blowing our clothing. I think this is... This picture here is me when I was, this is when I was a little heavier. When you were a little heavier. Oh, pull up, Tony. Yes. That picture yeah, is when I was just a hair heavier, than, heavier than I am and now. You're standing there kind of funny, too. Yeah, it looks like yeah. I'm crooked. There. No, I think you're probably blowing, Tony, with oh, the, the force of the really, wind. I, the wind. I just want to say that, you yes. know, to go to this place at midnight, and we take groups of people there, we'll leave... Uh, the B&B, &B, the bed and breakfast, which is on the North Sea, an old manor house. Go there about midnight, and we stay all night long until the sun comes up. But these people go with cameras and recorders, and they get tremendous psychic pictures there. But you know, it's not just Whitby Abbey uh, that has uh, achieved fame because of vampires. In North Woodstock, Vermont, in 1898, a man by the name of Curtis his body was exhumed by seven medical doctors at the medical school at that time because they felt he was a vampire. Mm -hmm. And this is in the history of Woodstock. It's right in the library. They exhumed his body, and he had been buried six months before. His body was as fresh as the day they put it in there. They had surgically taken out the heart, put it in a pot, put it on the village green, and burned it to ashes. They performed ceremonies, religious ceremonies, over the body and over the heart and buried it. But for years later, where they buried that heart on the village green, now this is the medical school with seven doctors and a director. There would be rumblings and psychic phenomena. Psychic energy would seen all around there. They would hear all kinds of sounds. But the most interesting thing is that 20 minutes away from where they buried this man in the graveyard, was a small village called Chittenden. Mm -hmm. I've heard of it. Still there today. Mm -hmm. And Chittenden was made famous by the Eddie brothers. The Eddie brothers were boys that would manifest numerous spirits, even as children. Their father was kind of a cruel man. He was a farmer, ignorant. And uh, when the boys would go into a catatonic state, he thought they were fooling around. He would actually take live coals and drop it in their hands. And they bore those scars right till the day they died. And they did live to be in their 90s. But in that farmhouse in Chittenden, which is still there today, 40 and 50 apparitions, images of ghosts and figures from all over the world. Now, I'm talking 1898. I'm talking 1870. Um, their mother came from Scotland. She was very, very clairvoyant. And they were very clairvoyant. They were physical mediums, but to the extent that 40 and 50 apparitions would appear. They would be in full dress, sometimes princes from India, Arabia, uh, kings and queens of the past. And people would go to this old farmhouse, and they would stay there for a week. I think they paid something like $5 for the week, room and board, just to see these manifestations. But it was so famous that Colonel Orcott and Madame Blavatsky who was the leading medium of her day, came from Russia to the United States to go to Chittenden to experience these phenomena, which they did. Now, not far from the farmhouse was a cave. It's called Hato's Cave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a rock that goes up, and there is a cave there. It looks like a grotto. But a lot of the people that would visit the Eddy Farm mm -hmm. would go to this, as Lorraine said, a grotto, and... Uh, when the moon was full, they would see 30, 40 Indians in full regalia. Those were American Indians. And among them, of course, was what they called Chief Honto, mm -hmm. who would appear on the stone. We've gone there. Lorraine had experiences, uh, which she can tell you about now. I've had numerous experiences, but there at the, gr at the gr um, grotto that Ed is describing, Tony, the stones come down so that it, it forms almost like a waterfall effect on either side of this grotto. And I watched psychically as the spirits all stood right in line 
coming down, almost like there was some sort of a, a show that was being put on. It was, it was so beautiful. Now, others that were with us described a feeling that came over them, but it wasn't visible to anybody. And unfortunately, we never captured that as a psychic photo as we did the photos taken in Borley Church, mm -hmm. which was a remarkable thing. But still, there was communication. Okay, so to sum up, Stonehenge is a mysterious place. It sure is. You've had is. experiences there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Whitby Abbey we know is a mysterious place. Oh, yes. And there's evil that could manifest itself there. I've yes. had that happen there myself. Yeah, that could be that Vampires, sad, as you say, are, are, are real. real. Mm -hmm. Are there even re more recent cases than that one? Or are, are you think there's a vampire out there today, perhaps? Oh, I know that at Highgate in London that they have reported what could be vampires. Um, Lorraine and I went there. It's one of the weirdest cemeteries you'd ever want to see. Mm. It goes back over a thousand years, of course. And uh, the tombstones are so old that the trees have grown right up around the tombstones. It's like a forest there. Mm. But Highgate would be another place where vampires were reported. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say to the audience, if I could, when this program is aired, when you physically watch this program on your local access channel, unfortunately I won't, but fortunately, Ed Warren, Lorraine Warren will be at Whitby Abbey they will be in all the haunted locations. They're going for two weeks in May, starting May 16th. Mm -hmm. So I would assume that when this show is broadcast, they will be um, going Wandering all over. The Moors of Scotland. The, the Moors of Scotland and, and uh, Borley, the places we've talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, where Doris May was at the Hollybush. They're going to be at all those locations. Lorraine and Ed, I appreciate tonight. I appreciate it. It was very interesting. Thank you. Again, the address to write would be P.O. Box 41 mm -hmm. in Monroe. Yes. Just address it to the Warrens. Yes. P.O. Box 41, Monroe, 06468. Right. To the Highlands of Scotland. To the Highlands of Scotland also. <laughs> so until next time, for Lorraine Warren, for Ed Warren, and bring me back some good scotch. Oh, I promise, um, Tony. I'm Tony Sparrow. Good night. That is the end of the video. Comment down below if you want to see a part six of this series and please like and subscribe so we can reach our 10K subscribers goal by the end of the year. Thanks for watching and we will see you in the next one.